You know, I really enjoyed everything that, that everyone's been sharing, and uh, the Lord has been dealing with me along the lines, really, of, of everything that everyone's been saying. <clears throat> Some of you may remember last year, I was sharing on the firstborn, and I have, uh, I have continued to do that all year long at our fellowship and in our Bible school, still sharing on that subject. And... Um, and we'll probably be doing that for, honestly, and I'm being honest, years to come. Because the Lord has so deeply touched my heart on uh, what he's been sharing with me. And uh, <clears throat> several have uh, shared out of the life of Abraham. And I'm sitting back there going, well, that's where I'm going to share so what I decided is that I would pick up where Jimmy left off. <laughs> I did steal his notes. Um, not really. And we'll get into uh, a progression that I was seeing with Abraham. And Abraham, in this, in this sharing that I'll be sharing from, um, is, is like the believer in this sense. He is trying to figure out who the firstborn is. Who... Jesus is, and in a certain sense, you can say that he's trying to come to a revelation of him, and he's working his way through a whole lot of people to try to figure out, is this, is this the one, is this the one, is this the one? And um, so we're going to start in Genesis 13, <clears throat> and I'll just read um, verse 1, because I'm not going to stay a long time with Lot. <clears throat> There's a lot I could share about Lot. Verse 1, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. Okay, and so I want you to notice, and Lot with him, because if you, you look at the scriptures prior to this, <clears throat> Abraham came out of the Earl, Ur of Chaldees, and he brought Sarah, and of course Terah was his father, and uh, you know, the group that came with him, and Lot went with them. And then when they left Haran, Abraham came into the land, and Lot went with him. And so the Lord is speaking to Abraham, and he's speaking to him about the seed. He's speaking about the son that you're going to have. And he is, um, he is expressing his heart to Abraham about the plan that he has, and that plan is primarily related to the coming forth of the son. Well, Abraham knows that Sarah is barren, so he's trying to figure out who is going to get the inheritance and who this is going to relate to, and at this stage, the only person that he's got and the only one that they've got with them that's younger than them is Lot. So he is kind of looking around and going, well, this must, everything God's saying must be about Lot. And in the verses that follow this, and Jimmy alluded to that, <clears throat> they end up having an argument, Lot and his herdsmen, uh, with Abraham or Abram and his herdsmen, and they get into this strife situation. And, um, uh, you know, there's a division, and they end up dividing up. And one factor that I noticed that I'd never really seen before is that when Abraham left uh, the land and went into Egypt, God didn't speak to him that whole time. And when he came out, God still didn't speak to him. Okay? And that's significant because what God wants to talk about is the son that he's going to bring forth. And God's not talking to him about that because because uh, in, in Abraham's mind, he's thinking, this is going to be the seed. This is going to be the one. Lot is it. He's the only possible uh, candidate for being the firstborn. And so then the strife comes up, and there's an argument. And in that, and I'll, I'll show you what I believe to be the proof that Abraham was thinking uh, in terms of Lot, <clears throat> This argument comes up, and in, within that, Abraham begins to realize this isn't the one. Because he's father Abraham, and Lot's supposed to be the son, but there's strife between them. 
Now, we know there's no strife between the father and his son. Okay. So he begins to realize that, and he begins to move in a different way. And so he says, <clears throat> he says to Lot, you know, take whatever land you want, you know, take the best, whatever you want, and I'll, go, I'll take the other side. I'll, if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. So he says, you know, go ahead and do that. So two things are going on at that moment. One is that Abraham has already figured out, I need to separate this guy from my heart and from my understanding of being the son. He is not the son that I thought God was talking about. Okay? And so, but the other thing that comes up is Lot thinks this is proof that I'm the son because he's saying the land is... It's, you know, it's your inheritance. He didn't say it's your inheritance. He just said, choose whatever part of the land that you want. And so he chooses the best land down towards, you know, heading toward Egypt or, and Sodom. And so then this split comes. And then, and here's where the proof comes that I believe that um, Abraham thought that Lot was the seed. As soon as... As Lot leaves, God speaks again. God opens up. And now look at verse uh, 14. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated. Do you see that? That's significant. He speak, I'm going to speak to you now. Now that you've separated your heart from this one thinking he's the seed and he's not the seed. That's not my son. That's not the one that I want you to be honoring. That's not the one that, that my words have been about. You've been applying them to your family, your, your seed, your, you know, what you understand. And that is not the one that is my seed. And that is not the one of my heart. And so it says, and after that lot separated from him, he said this, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And so from this point on, he starts talking about the seed. He's talking about the seed. He's talking about his seed He's, God is talking to Abraham about the one that he has in mind, not the one you had in mind, not the view that you had. You, it's as if he's saying, you this whole time have been taking my words and applying it to Lot when I, that's not who I want you to have as your seed, not the firstborn. He's not the firstborn. And he says in verse 16, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. And so here he is, he is declaring what is in his heart concerning his seed, and he's trying to adjust Abram to understand, look, you're looking in the natural, you're looking with your understanding, and you need to start coming into my view, but not just my view, my heart concerning my son, my heart concerning my son. Not just teaching, but you need to understand my heart concerning my son. So, so there's a progression, and I'm starting at the tail end of Lot, because he's looking at Lot based on his own bloodline and based on what he thinks is valuable in his family and what he thinks is, is, is going to be the seed. And God is wiping that away and saying, that's not the seed, that's not the one. Okay, so <clears throat> what's going to happen? Well, Abram is going to uh, begin to, a, a little period of time is going to pass, and then he's going to start looking at someone else. Something else as the seed, instead of the, the seed of the father's heart. Instead of the son of the father's heart. He doesn't know the Father's heart. He may be listening to the information that he's getting from God and saying, oh, this is theologically sound and this is good. But he doesn't realize that the seed is the son of the Father's love. Amen? It's the, it's the son of the Father's love. So we have... Um, uh, and, and so we're fixing to go through the next one. We're going to run through several false firstborns that, that we think were the, was the firstborn, that we would choose. 
that we would view based on circumstances, well, it could only be this. And God, God's going to, He's going to take them all down. He's going to take them all down. So, um, Genesis 15, in verse 2, and in, in verse uh, 1, this is, um, this is uh, in verse, uh, chapter 14, they had just got through with the story pertaining to Melchizedek and all that that pertained to. And, of course, this was when Abram and his uh, 130, I forget the number, men went out and defeated all the kings of Chedorlaomer. So God comes up here in the first verse and he says, you know, I am your shield and I am your exceeding great reward. And, and look in verse 2 what Abraham says. Look what he says to that. Verse 2, and Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me seeing I go childless or seeing I go seedless or seeing I don't have a son but you're promising me the son and you're promising me that everything is surrounding the sun and is in relationship to the sun, but I don't have him yet. I don't see him. I don't, I don't understand this. And, and now that's a, that's a pretty bold statement for him to do because he's doing it in the midst of God coming to him and saying, I'll be your shield and I'll be your reward. And his first words out of his mouth is, that's great. Thank you for being my shield. Thank you for being my great reward. But I want the seed. I want the son that you've been talking about. Anybody ever felt that way? Yeah. Lord, I want the son of your heart, not the son of my theology. Amen? And so, um, so he goes on to say, well, let's go ahead and read through that again. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. So he's considering Eliezer now. All right. And Eliezer, the, the things that he mentions about Eliezer is he's faithful. He's one born in my house. He's really been with me through trials. He has stood with me. Maybe since, since Sarah can't have the seed and since it's not Lot, maybe it's faithfulness. And we start looking at faithfulness in somebody and we say, that's the seed and I want that. But the Lord is not, the seed is not an attribute. It's a person. And we can identify all kind of attributes and say that's the seed while we're focusing on something that is short of the Son of God Himself. Just Him. And whatever He brings forth, He'll bring forth because He's life. But we do. We fixate on, okay, well, this is a high quality and so this must be the one that God's talking about. And so that's what He's saying right here to God. But at least... I mean, even though his, his attitude seems a little wrong in my opinion, because he says, you know, you know what, when are you going to give me a seed? When are you going to give me the thing you promised? But at least the, the good thing about him is, is his heart is like a compass. And he says, I want the son. I want the one that you promised. I want the son. And he hadn't showed up yet. And you need to bring him forth. You need to reveal him to me so that I, and in me so that I can bring that son forth. Well, the next verse, verse uh, 4. Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Not an outward seed. Not, a, not something separate from you. But an inward life, an inward seed. Christ in you. The hope of glory. And when he says that, he See, here, here's Abram, and he's trying to be in tune with the Lord, and he's trying to keep his heart right. So he says, where is the seed? Where's the one? I want him. I want, I want him. And, and then he brings up Eliezer, and God speaks up and says, this shall not be 
the seed. Eliezer's not it. And you're looking at someone else already. You've got your eyes first on Lot and going, well, it's got to be Lot because there's no other way. And now you're looking at Eliezer and say, this has got to be the seed. And, and, and I'm telling you, we do that. We do that. We um, look at everything and everyone and we try to figure out, well, how do I live this? Or how do I get the life, you know? Or how do I have him revealed? Or, you know, and, and we're doing methods and we're hearing things that we're, we're trying to get behind when the only thing we need to get behind is the Father's heart concerning His Son because He's the only one that really knows Him and the Holy Spirit. And we're, we're digging around. We're, we're, we're looking around. We're trying to... I'll tell you what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure it out. Okay. Wow, you know, that was a great sermon Brother Lumen preached. But how do I? What do I? Right? It's, a lot of that has I in it. How do I do this? What do I do? You know, instead of Father, Father, I have no clue of the seed of your heart, the son of your heart, the son of your love. Reveal him in me. <clears throat> so he says, this shall not be the heir. As he's pointing to Eliezer. This, you know, he's basically saying, look, I don't care how good he looks. I don't care how faithful Eliezer has been. That's not my son. And quit pointing to him. Quit acting like that's the one when you're totally contrary to my heart right now. To my, you know, we say my view, but, but it's not just a view. It's his son. To the father, it's his son. Amen? It's not a doctrine. That's not a doctrine to the father. That's the reality of his heart. It's the, it's the, as I said, the son of his love. It's the son that he wants and desires. And we're looking at different things and saying, was this him or is that? Is, you know? So he goes on. And uh, in verse 4 again, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine. And I was thinking, why did, you know, why did the, because it said the word of the Lord came forth, the word of the Lord came forth. We're going, oh, I want the word of the Lord to come forth. The word of the Lord came forth. And it came forth because he's reacting to your choice, to my choice, to Abraham's choice. I, that's not him. The word of the Lord didn't come forth to bless him. It didn't come forth to, to give him comfort or precious promises or, or you know, that, that sort of thing. The word of the Lord came forth because the Father was reacting against His, against my choosing of anything that's not His Son. Even the thought of it, even the thought of choosing something else and putting it in front of His Son. This is not it. This is not Him. You could say part of it would be maybe anger, but part of it is maybe hurt because we're totally missing the son of his heart and we're formulating and we're, we're, we're uh, you know, doing all these methods to try to figure it out instead of just going, I don't know. There is no way we can know. This is, this is God. From before the foundation of the world, now, right now at this time. And we'll never get this. Until we begin to pursue, Lord, Father, what is your mind? What is your heart? Show me. Reveal the seed of your heart. So, so I, I remember looking at that when he said, um, God comes to him and says, you know, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. 
and at least Abraham's going, I, right now, that's not what I'm after. You know, we would go, praise God, yes, yes, God's going to be my shield. Yes, glory. We would, we would want to, you know, if God actually appeared to us and said, I am your shield, we would go, glory to God, and we'd want to go out and start a new ministry called the God is my shield ministry. And spread the, spread the message, you know. Come hear the message when God, he doesn't do that. He says, I want the son. That's where my heart is. I'm, that's what I'm after. So in verse uh, 5 and 6, still in Genesis 15. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. He says, okay. Because it's like Abram saying, look, show me, don't tell me anymore. God, please, don't just tell me. Show me. He says, okay, come here. Come on. Come with me. He takes him out. And you know, back then, they didn't have any street lights or anything. Anybody remember when you were kids and you could look up and just see a million stars that seemed like? It was just incredible. Nowadays, you look up and there's like three stars and you go... Where'd they go? Well, it's, they're still there. Well, he took Abram there and he shows him and he's not just seeing a few sprinkling of stars. He's not even seeing a lot of stars. I mean, he's, he's seeing the Milky Way. He's seeing galaxies. He's seeing constellations. He's seeing galaxy upon galaxy in constellations which have more galaxies built within them as far as the eye can see. And this is, this is affecting him because remember when he, when he got rid of Lot, it seemed like every time, it seems like every time God gets rid of somebody, he wants to show him something. So with Lot, when he got rid of Lot, he said, sands of the sea. Now he's showing the stars. And he says, this, this right here, this represents my son. And some of you have heard me share on this before and you remember that when I did, I, it was as if I was standing there with the Lord and I, and, and I think Abraham did that. We're all focused on the stars and the depth and the amount of and whatever and we're, count, we're, you know, we're counting. He said if you can count it, you can't count it. So he's not trying to get you to figure out by counting. Well, how am I going to figure out the son that he's talking about? Well, you're looking in the wrong place. <laughs> We're looking at the stars instead of the father's face who's showing us what the stars represent. His son, the father's looking up there and he's saying, the vastness of this. This is how much He fills my heart. This is the glory of Him in my heart. This is the one, the Son, that I know it's like Him, but you can't even count that because it doesn't even fill up the fullness of my heart for my Son. And Abram's looking at the Father because it didn't say He believed the stars and it was counted to Him for righteousness. Amen? It didn't say that. It said he believed God. So he's looking at the Father and he's saying, oh my God, look at his face. Look at how he's reacting to the Son, to the one when he just talks about him, when he presents it, when he's, when he's setting it forth, you know? He's being... He, the Father is overwhelmed with, with love and with, the, with heart for this Son. And, and he's getting to see the Father just... Just saying, this is this, this. And I said this when I was originally sharing it. He doesn't see a bunch of stars. He sees one sun. 
It may, you know, if it did represent, each star represented somebody that had Christ in them, he'd still only see one sun. But the way I saw it was to him, this is the sun. This is the vastness. This is the glory. This is the, the, the depth and the length and the height and the breadth. And, you know, but before when he was talking to Lot, he said, he said, you know, look at the land from, you know, from Euphrates to all the way over to here and up there and over there. That's, that's going to be the inheritance of the seed. Now he's going, forget what I said before. It's small. It's small. Let's just go through the universe from the farthest reaches. That's the sun of my heart. That's, and he's seeing not just the sun because it says, the Scriptures say, he believed God. He didn't just believe the information. He's, he believes God. God's heart. This is because this question was, you know, where's where's the son? I want the son. He's looking at the father and he's looking at his heart and he's going, he is committed. He is in love. He is wants nothing else. He has nothing else on his mind and nothing else at work in him. He wants this son and it's so vast in his heart. It's like a universe pertaining to his son. And he's looking at that and he's saying, I believe you and I believe that you'll give me the son because that's what you want. And I'm sorry I'm yelling, but I, that's what you want. That's what's in you. And I believe you and I believe that my hope and my my. Faith in, is in you, not the stars. Not because he couldn't even count them. He couldn't understand the depth of them. He didn't know anything about galaxies or constellations or any of that stuff. So he doesn't know the depth. The only way to know the depth was to look at it that the Father, as it were, look into his heart and see the vastness of this thing to the Father, and go, "Wow." Like I said, when this is being written, it wasn't, it was written, but it wasn't originally to Abraham written. It was him and God and the vastness of the Father's heart. There was no doctrine. Amen? There was no doctrine. And you don't look in the Father's heart pretending to his son and say, Oh, that's a really deep doctrine. It's not a doctrine to the Father. And, and so, you know, we look at all those things and, and you know, it's, it's, not even a, it's not even God declaring the promises to the Jews. There's, oh, there's going to be a lot of Jews, folks. There may have been a lot of Jews from that time to this time, but they do not fill up constellations and, and, and the vastness of space doesn't even come close. N nothing does. Not the amount of people that have Christ in them doesn't feel that. That has to be a picture purely of the Son in the Father's heart. All together, one Son. Hallelujah. Not, not that. Not, and you know what? It's not a Bible lesson either. This was written because of a real event that really touched a man that made him believe that I'm gonna that seed's gonna come forth not because I want it but because he wants it. Amen. Not because of me. No, I don't have to formulate a doctrine. I don't have to 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 put this into a Bible lesson and and you know write it down and then shove it to you and say read that and it'll be it. We have okay. Let me like this. Sorry, but this is the. So, so let's go back before time. That's the same father that loved his son then. Okay, so let's move forward in time. Now we're at Abraham's time. And, and Abram is watching the father as he declares his son and watching his face, watching his heart, watching his movements. And he's doing that. Okay, let's go down to our time. We, it's the same father. It's the same son. We can go to the same one. We can experience the same thing. Does this make sense? I mean, it's, this, it's almost like 
that he doesn't really exist anymore. Now it's just the teaching. And yes, he's, it's true, he does. But, you know, we have to scratch around on ink on white paper to figure it out. When that same one toward his son, that same father, is exactly the same <laughs> that he was before toward his son. And we can... We had that same privilege. You know, I was looking at that scripture that says uh, in Galatians, and it says, if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. And you may not agree with this, and it's brand new to me because I was just looking at it, but in uh, Galatians 3.16, it says, uh, now he saith unto seeds, not as of many, but unto one, which seed is Christ, right? Y'all are familiar with that one. But this, this verse looked a little funny to me because it says, you know, if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. And I thought, well, I'm not Abraham's seed. Or I'm not the seed of the Father. That's Christ, right? But if you're Christ, you are Abraham's seed. And so this thought came to me. Not the Jews, but we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise that the same things that he saw, the same Father, as it were, the true spiritual reality of the vastness of the Son, all of that is ours. If we're Christ, we're in line for the inheritance of what? The vastness of, of the seed. To receive the seed. Now, again, I have never saw that before. And, you know, I'm sure I can be instructed and in, how wrong that is, but it just, it just hit me though. It was like, if you're Christ, if you belong to him, then you're Abraham's seed. And if he's your life, and then we're heirs to be able to stand there with the father and say, you know, I want, you know, I want the vastness of, the heart, of what's in your heart toward the son. And he can show the same son to us. And, and it's, it's, you know, we don't have to go all the way up to Abraham's time. We don't even have to go as it were. Now, um, yes, stay in the scripture. But we don't have to go to the scriptures and try to dream that up. We can there have the Spirit of God show us the exact same thing, the exact reality, because it has not changed one iota from the beginning before time in the Father's heart. And the Son has it. I found that to be encouraging. <laughs> so, you know, as I was looking at, at him viewing, uh, the father viewing the son, I thought, you know, these scriptures are not sermon material. Not supposed to be sermon material. I'm talking about me standing up here. This is not sermon material. This is living reality in the heart of God for his son. This is forever. I can preach a sermon on it, but I cannot show you, I can't say like he did Abram, come here. You really want the seed? Then you're going to be blown away, dude, because it is way more than your little version of Lot and Eliezer up to this point. And you know, we, we keep going with the several other versions of the son of the seed when it's not them. So, so our goal when we're sharing, our goal is not to give you Jesus the way we understand him. My goal isn't. But the way that he is, the way that the Father sees the Son. That would be that would be the goal. Because we all still need to see more. And he's so vast and he's so big in the Father's heart that throughout the eternal ages to come, anybody remember that scripture in Ephesians? We'll be learning the fullness of him. So I'm going to have to skip some parts here. Aren't you glad that I do that so we can quit on time? <laughs> okay, let's look at verse 8 through 10. So this follows up. Um, well, before I say that, let me say this. Um, in Romans 4, there's a portion of Scripture in Romans 4 that talks about 
that incident where God took him out and showed him the stars and um, and it refers or there's some words that go along there and it talks about the resurrection of Christ. So I could just hear somebody saying, well, that, that represents the resurrection of Christ and therefore uh, it, everything you're talking about in the Father's heart is invalid, which I'm going, do you really want to invalidate the Father's heart for a son? That's not a good idea. But, it, but the reference to the resurrection if it is talking about resurrection as it is, it's not like Jesus getting down, dying, and then saying, okay, I'm up now. Resurrection. It would be talking about the fullness as he's, the Father is showing Abram the, the, all the, the fullness of the constellations in the whole universe. He would be saying, here is what's, what I'm excited about. The Father would say, this is what turns me on is the fullness of Christ will be this vast in my heart. Not us resurrected, but Him as a resurrection and filling and being the fullness of all of it. From now on, I could just hear the Father's heart singing. From now on, if this is the, what we would call the resurrection, what the Father calls my Son in fullness, now, I'm getting my son in fullness the way I desire him. Okay, so let's look at verse 8 now. Genesis 15. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Whereby shall I know? I, I want, you know, it began with, with the Father saying, I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. It moved into the Father saying, you know, and it was counted to Him for faith. You have faith. But at this point, Abram has been in the land for 10 years. And he's going, look, I'm... I, Praise God for promises. <laughs> you know, praise God for words that have encouraged me that you're my shield in faith. But I need to know in a real way that this son is going to come forth. I need to know this. I need to have such assurance. And in fact, he's even, he's even beyond assurance at that point. He's saying, I want the reality of it. I'm tired of talking about it. I'm tired of, you know, it's like a, a donkey with a stick and the carrot, you know. Anybody ever see that before? And, and it's what keeps the donkey going, you know. He pulls a little cart and you sit on the cart, you know, and you move the carrot closer and he goes, okay, you know, and they move it back and then, you know, keeps you going. I want to eat the carrot. You know, I, I can see uh, Abraham going, I'm tired of renting the land. I'd like to own it. Because <laughs> you know? he, again, he'd been there 10 years and really didn't possess hardly anything. And the son hadn't come forth and he's going, I need to know this. I need it real. It's got to be real in me. You got to admire him for that. Got to admire the hunger and the pressing in because it's going to be a little while longer before that actual seed comes forth. <clears throat> so he takes him and he, verse 9, uh, he's going to give it the explanation. It's like in, in verse 8 and 7 there when he showed him the stars, it's like, okay, you've seen my heart for my son. Like when he took him out to look at you, you viewed my heart. I opened my heart. Abraham, that wasn't a sermon. I opened my heart and showed you my desire, my vastness of how I view him. But now, you want to know? You really want to know how you're gonna, this is going to come about? <clears throat> so he takes him in verse 9 
And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each one against another. But the birds he divided not. So Abraham says, Whereby shall I know? And the father starts speaking in crucified language. That's how he communicates. He speaks in crucified language. You want to know the whereby? You want to know that? Through the knowledge of the cross. Through the reality of the cross. That's how, you're going to, that's how it's going to come about. Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit the cross? That's how you're going to know it. That's how you're going to have the reality of it come to pass. So he, gathers, he tells him, gather up all these different animals and, and uh, things, and he puts it all together. <clears throat> and when I was looking at it, I thought, well, that's strange, because the list there um, actually lists every sacrifice when God instituted the tabernacle, every sacrifice that they offered up except one. Didn't mention... Did anybody catch what it, what it left out? A lamb. And I went, well, that's funny. <laughs> you know, because most of the sacrifices had to do with the lamb. And I just asked the Holy Spirit, I said, I, you know, this just seems a little funny to me. And he said, all of it together is so that you could behold the lamb of God. You know, okay, well, let's see. Let's give an example of that. All of those those are a picture of one sacrifice in Romans 12. It says, present your bodies, plural, a living sacrifice. It's plural, present your bodies, but you don't present them as individual sacrifices. It's one, and it's Christ, the Lamb of God. And that's what John the Baptist said of Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. There He is. There within that lamb that went to the cross, all the sacrifices were fulfilled at one time. He didn't have to you know, die, come back up, jump back up there for another category of, of you know, sins and now the sweet savor offerings, and now the thank offerings and all this kind of stuff. No, it's one. It's just one. And this is just one offering. And again, so the Father had taken him out and showed him his view, his heart pertaining to the, the Son. So shall my seed be. If you can number them, which you can't because your little mind has no clue how great the Son is in my heart. But now, you want to know how you're going to know? You want to know how you're going to inherit Come over here to now we're, now we're at an altar. We just left looking over there and now we're going to look at the altar. And as we look at the altar, we're going to see every kind of offering wrapped up in one settled. This is how you're going to know. You're going to have to see Christ crucified. You're going to have to hear me speak in crucified language and we're going to have to stop always talking about the earth. You know, I was thinking about that. Actually, I was thinking about it when I was at James's house and just walking around the front yard. And I felt like I was just seeing uh, the Father sitting there. This is what really wasn't an image, but it was the, an image of thought. Um, the Father there and... So the example that I came up with would be like, and, and it's not this, so I'll explain it beyond this, but it's like the father is sitting there and he is weeping over uh, a loss. Let's just say a loss. And then we come in and we go, hey, father, could you, you know, uh, on work, at work, I've been having a hard time. Could you... Could you fix that? And uh, also, you know, uh, I got a hangnail last week and it really bothered me. And could you deal with that? And he's just, he's just, and I'm, the, the contrast isn't the death, but by saying he's dealing with the loss of something, 
I'm trying to paint a picture of how a, a, a great the affront is that someone would just come in and go, hey, you know, hey, you know, and just talking, and I need this, and do that for me, and, and then walk out. Okay, well, let's take away the death thought of the, a loss, and let's put the Father's heart the way that it, it painted it there before the stars and then with the altar. And let's see someone who has always been, has always loved this son, and doesn't, apparently doesn't think in any other terms from before the foundation of the world, afterwards, he thinks in terms of his son. And we walk in and we go, well, okay, me, my this and my that, and, and I'm, I'm using this as an example of the Father showing the vastness of all of this and saying, you know, you, you can't even come close to counting this. And the, the, the pea brain, as if you will, of us, and we're coming in there to that mind, that heart, that is so full of His Son, so ecstatic with the beauty And we're not standing there with him and saying, I can't see it all like you can, but I want to see more. Instead, we're standing there just talking about our lives on earth. And, and he's, the father's going, I never lived there. I've never been there. I just want to talk about my son. I would love for us to just talk about my son. Why do we always have to talk about this other stuff? Why is that so important to you? This is where I live. This is what I love. And in seeing that, I realized the smallness of my own understanding. I realized I can't, Father, I can't count all the stars. And you, you do understand it's not counting all the stars. It is how much of the vastness can you take in? Because it's that much. And, and see, if you could count 200 stars, he'd say, it's not about the stars. It's about the representation of my son. That's what it's about. So, so he takes him to that altar and he says, this here, the cross, this is the assurance. The cross is the assurance. The cross is the knowledge. The cross is the understanding of the inheritance of the inheritance. And he gives, him, he gives him a picture of Christ crucified. This is it. With all of these different sacrifices, this is, the Father would say, this is my full picture of Christ crucified. You want to know whereby? You want to know how? Look at this altar. Look at the slain. Look at it as one sacrifice. See it as my son. And then you'll know how it's all going to come, come to pass. So, that is, what is all that about? It's only about one thing. God is marking off another firstborn that Abraham, Abram has come up with that this is going to be the one, you know. Because, well, it's got to be, you know, we keep doing that. Well, it's got to be this way. And every firstborn that Abraham picked from Lot all the way down to Ishmael, the thought in the mind was, well, it's got to come this way or it's got to be this way. Every one of it. It's, it's always missing the mark of the sun. Wait a minute. No of the son of the father's heart of the son of the father's heart because if we just say the son then we go okay so uh, that was history Old Testament Abraham and all of that kind of stuff but now I'm living in this day and in this day it's about a theme, a theme of the revelation of Christ and the son and this and that instead of 
going, you know, the faith of Abraham, you know, that's what we're supposed to have, right? We're supposed to go back to that faith. Instead of just saying, you know, it's not a, it's not, it's not a theme. And I don't believe that everybody here sees that or thinks like that. I'm just trying to make a point that it's not a theme. There's a real father and a real son, and that real father will always want his son, and it'll never be a theme to him, and he'll never giggle over us talking about a theme. He'll never ha have joy bubble up and go, oh, this pleases me so much. They have no clue about him, but they talk about him all the time, you know, or they talk correctly. How about that? They talk correctly about him. But it's still got to be him. So, God in his, you know, you, you could say God in his mercy marks off Eliezer now. But it's really not God in his mercy. It is God in his straight, narrow focus that I want the sun. And anything that's not that, I'm going to start working on knocking it off the, the list. All right, so... Um, Well, I'm not sure what time I'm supposed to quit. J Jimmy just showed me something a while ago, or somebody back there did, that I had 45 minutes. I'm going, oh, it's pretty long. <laughs> oh, you sneaky guy, you. All right, well, <clears throat> okay, so we're just going to have to talk now. <clears throat> and that is, um, so the next phase, you know, this, you're probably more familiar with the next phase. And that is, um, Sarah comes up with a great idea. That'd be a good title for a song. Sarah came up with a good idea. It was wrong, but <laughs> and she comes up with a, this idea that um, we're going to, you know, I tell you what, same, same storyline with Lot and Eliezer. I tell you what. I think I've come up with a way that we can bring forth the sun. That the sun can come forth. And God will be happy. The Father will be happy. And, and, you know, and, you know, his name's going to be Ishmael. And God's going to say, yeah, Ishmael is like the stars, the vastness of the depth in my heart. That's what it, no. Can anybody see how all of these views are so low from the Father's eternal heart focus of his son? Well, we'll figure a plan. We'll do something. And God's just, every, every day, he's just, you know, I'm waiting until, Abraham, I'm waiting until you get so old, <laughs> so old, that you will stop this. Bless you. So old that we won't have to keep jumping through these circus hoops and I can bring forth my son. So you know the story. So they go through the whole thing and, you know, they have Ishmael and uh, like I said, I've got 10 minutes here, so this is the short version of the last part, you know. And um, so God doesn't talk to Abraham for 13 years. It's a 13 year gap between 16 and 17, chapter 16 and 17. And then God comes back in 17 and begins and says, as, a, as for me, my covenant is with you. Okay, it's not really about a covenant covenant. It's not, that's not the way he thinks. He's going, look, we're, we're making a deal that the son's going to be everything. But we go, well, it's a covenant, and they went into, well, it is, but not in the father's heart. He's just like, I just want the sun, okay? If we have to, if you need a piece of paper, fine, but you know, I want my son. And so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and mark Ishmael off. Okay? Short version. So that's a third firstborn down, third one down. So finally, finally Sarah gets pregnant. And has the seed, right? The firstborn. And so, and I'll, 
I'm not saying that's legitimate yet. I'm just saying that in front of you. <clears throat> so he, Sarah takes that baby. She holds it and she loves it. And then he gets a little older. And Abraham takes him by the little hand and they walk and they're happy. And he swings him and you know does all this stuff with little... Little Isaac, and they're going, oh, this is it. This is the seed. This is the one. This is, thank you, God. We're so happy. We're such a happy family. We knew that being a happy family was what was really in your heart more than anything else. No. <clears throat> because Isaac, at that stage, was not the Firstborn. Okay, well, there's several ways of looking at that statement. One is we could say, well, Ishmael was the firstborn. Well, not, no. I mean, Ishmael was the firstborn of Abraham and Hagar, but not Abraham and Sarah. And God said, through Sarah, you're going to have this. But he's not the firstborn. He's not the firstborn until t chapter 22 of Genesis. God finally comes and God's ready and this is, this is His plan, this is His heart, this is the fulfillment of everything that He meant when He started talking all along the way about the seed going to inherit and everything and He goes, take now thy son, thine only son, the son whom thou lovest. Who is saying that to Abraham? The father. The father. The same one who's going to take now his son, his only son, the son whom he loves, and offer him as a burnt offering unto me. And Abraham, if you read the story, I don't know if you've seen the movie. Anybody ever seen the movie, the Bible, and he throws a real fit? You know, no! no, no. It's a, the guy that played uh, Patton in... <laughs> He's throwing a fit and everything. Well, the scriptures don't really show him throwing a fit. <clears throat> Somebody said, have you, you know, have you ever seen the movie, the Bible? And I said, well, I read the book and it's better. <clears throat> <clears throat> anyway, so he's throwing, throwing this fit and everything. Well, not in real life. Abraham just seems to go, okay, you know. He makes preparations. The next morning, get up and they go. and goes up there and... You know, he's, he's, you know, the, the sun's going, you know, well, we got the fire and we got the wood, but where's the lamb? That's what it, that was his words. Where's the lamb? And the father says sweetly to him, you're the lamb, kid. <laughs> you're the one. Actually, he says the father will provide himself a lamb. And so he puts him on the altar binds him on the altar. He raises the knife. And the father says, stop. And you, you go look at the words. Just don't, don't read it like a, a Bible story or you know this and that. I mean, every one of these places where God spoke and the word of the Lord came, it's, a, it's his heart. He is pouring out his heart. He's opening his heart to us. He is, he's not just giving promises and stuff. He's, he is trying to communicate the depth of his heart for his son. And now he goes, and when he speaks, it's like, now I know. And you, your son, your seed, this seed will be from da-da-da-da, from everything. And he just goes on. I mean, it's like he's just like ecstatic telling him all this. You know, this is it. This is what it was all about. So let me just close with this quickly because I bet I only got about a minute left. And that is <clears throat> Jesus of Nazareth. Well, you know, what I, sometimes I talk about uh, the first man and the last man. And we go, well, that's Adam, and, and that is. But sometimes I talk about the first man being Jesus of Nazareth and the new man being Christ in resurrection. And this is what J.W. is talking about and, and, and Jimmy and everybody else here. 
drawn it on the board and everything. The reality that he is that that Jesus of Nazareth is no longer around. We do not relate to him. Jesus of Nazareth touched everybody and healed them, but now we're his hands. You know, we go, oh Lord, touch me. Well, you know, if you're his hand, then you, <laughs> you know, oh, I'm touching you. But we're always still thinking in terms of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, just like um, Abraham, and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah were, were treating um, Isaac that way before the cross. Oh, he's beautiful. Oh, he makes me happy. Oh, he, it's so warm and fuzzy. Oh, everything is just great. You know, da 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 da. And God goes, okay, now let's take him to the cross. Let's begin to know him in and by the cross. Let's begin to wipe away all of the fuzzy feelings. And let's find him now as he is in the Father's heart. Amen? Still glad I came? Thank you for you three people that said yes.